In the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the ninth chapter. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Make us three, let us make three tents, one for you, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. The Gospel of our Lord. Open our eyes, Lord, we want to see Jesus, to reach out and touch him, and say that we love him. Open our ears, Lord, and help us to listen. Open our eyes, Lord, we want to see Jesus. Please be seated. Dear people of God, may God's grace, mercy, and peace be to you from the one who is, who was, who is to come, our Savior, who is Christ Jesus the Lord. Amen. Soren Kierkegaard once said, A man prayed, and at first he thought that prayer was talking, but he became more and more quiet, until in the end he realized that prayer is listening. Jesus takes Peter, James, and John on this mountain, and there he's transfigured. We hear that his clothing uh, became as white as snow, whiter than any person could ever bleach them. And this was an impressive thing for those disciples. They were terrified, and they didn't know what to do or say. Did they go there to pray? Together, or was this something even more so that Jesus was wanting to deliver to them, a message? Well, I think it's a little bit of both. But as they get up there, and Jesus is transfigured, we need to understand that the Greek word for transfigured is where we get our word metamorphosis. You know what metamorphosis is? Like the caterpillar changing into a... Um, a butterfly, thank you. I always said flutterby, but that's... <clears throat> what does it mean to have Jesus metamorphosed in front of them? What does it mean that Jesus changed? Did he change just in appearance, or was there another kind of change that took place? Well, I would say it's a little bit of both, because certainly his countenance, his uh, figure, his clothing changed, but there was something else that changed within the atmosphere. Because all of a sudden, Jesus is, t is uh, talking with Moses and Elijah. Moses, the one who brought the Ten Commandments from God to the people of Israel as they were traveling in the wilderness. And also for Elijah, the one who brought the prophecies, the powerful prophecies. And, and if you remember that great in incident on Mount Carmel, when he led this wonderful demonstration of God's power, when the prophets of Baal and he had a face-off on whose God was the powerful one, who was the real God. And we find out that the prophets of Baal, they put together their sacrifices in exactly the same way that uh, Elijah would. And they called upon Baal, and Baal didn't answer. Even with the tauntings of Elijah, well, maybe your God is asleep, or he's resting, or he's taking a vacation, or he's just not, you know, there. 
And so they would call out louder. They cut themselves as in the custom to uh, bloodletting, to get the attention of this God, and Baal never answered. So after a whole day's worth of that, Elijah says, step aside, boys. Let me show you how it's done. And he builds the, the altar with the stones. He puts the wood on top of the altar. He sets up the sacrifice and plays the places the meat on top of that. And then he orders that water be poured over the sacrifice. And then not only just one dousing of water, but he says, do it more, do it more, do it more, until the water soaked everything and ran down into the basin beneath the altar. And all Elijah had to say was, Lord, show him. And God went, Pow! And not only did it burn up the sacrifice, it burned up the stones, it burned up all the ground around and lapped up all the water. It was nothing left. So he was talking with Moses and Elijah. How would they know that this was Moses and Elijah? They just did. They just did. And as a result of their talking with Jesus, they were so afraid, they were so caught up in awe. What does this mean? Who is Jesus that he would be speaking with Moses and Elijah? They were so frightened that, here you go, Peter, with trying to speak on behalf of everybody else. Hey, it's really great that we're here. Tell you what, why don't we extend this? We'll make a tent for each one of you, and we can set up you know, a little powwow, and we'll have some fun. We'll learn all kinds of things. And all of a sudden, there was a cloud that came upon them. And the voice from the cloud says, This is my son, the one that I love. Listen to him. When was the last time that we had seen the cloud show up in Jesus' life? It was when he was baptized. Jesus steps out of the water, and the cloud is there. And the voice of God saying, This is my son, the one whom I love. I'm well pleased with him. God's presence was there. God's presence changed everything. God's presence changed the way that Jesus looked, and God's presence changed the way that things were going to function from that moment on. Because when Jesus took his disciples down off the mountain, that is when they really got to work. Now, let me ask you a question. If that happened today, and you were with Jesus, and you saw Moses and Elijah, how excited would you be? I heard a scared to death, not knowing what to do. Would you want to tell somebody what happened to you? I think I would. <laughs> Yeah, and wow, you ever stop to think, would they believe me? You know, just think of the amazement that was going on here. And I can imagine that they wanted to say something. They wanted to say, man, we got to go tell people. But Jesus says, no, don't. Not until the Son of Man is revealed, meaning himself as Messiah. So how do you hold that in? Well, Jesus told them, taught them how to hold it in until the time was right when he sent them out to do their first ministry and then when he gave them a great commission to go and talk to all nations and baptize them, to make disciples out of them, and teach them what he had commanded them to teach them. An excitement. Now, that was that day. If Jesus were to appear to us at this moment with uh, a couple of fellows that were big guns in the Bible, Moses and Elijah, for example, he would not say today, be quiet. Because the, he is already known as the Son of Man. He's already known as Messiah. He's already known as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He's already known as the Savior of the world. He's already known by those who have faith in him that he is the real deal. He is Jesus, the Son of God, and he has saved us by faith, by his grace. There would not be any of this thing where hold it in. 
He would say, go tell. Go tell. When we see the glory of God even now, we don't have to have Jesus all, all of a sudden appear before us with a, a couple of, our, uh, like a prophet and, uh, and a lawgiver. We don't need that. Because we have the, the story told by people who are eyewitnesses. We have the scripture, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. We have John's writings. We have Peter's writings. We have uh, Paul's writings. We have all of those to bring us to the knowledge of the truth that Jesus is the Son of God and to trust in him. So why aren't we telling in a better fashion? Because we know him. We know him. There's a Chinese man named Lin Yong who experienced the... Uh, what it's like to be transformed, to be transfigured, to be changed. This man was a very brilliant man. And for most of his life, he was an atheist. But his wife was a Christian. And he came to admire the serenity that he saw in her life. And uh, he recognized that the serenity was a result of the faith that she had in Jesus. One that he poo-pooed. He says, no, it doesn't exist. But watching her, seeing how her, her life continued to change, always for the better, that she grew, and she never got on his case. You know, you're a fool. You're an idiot. No, she loved him. She took care of him. She was a, um, a silent witness, you might say, just by what she did and how she responded to people and how she encouraged people. And so eventually he started going to church with her. Then all of a sudden he joined the church. Had something changed? Hmm. He became a Christian. And later on he wrote a book by the title of From Pagan to Christian. And he wrote that book to tell of his spiritual journey. And here's what he wrote. I return to the awe-inspiring simplicity and beauty of the teachings of Jesus. The scales began to fall from my eyes. He said, it is Jesus that I have found sufficient, a sufficiency which is joyously renewed every day. Looking back on my life, I know that for 30 years I lived in the world like an orphan. I am no orphan any longer. Listen to that once more. After Lynn found Jesus, he could say, I know that for 30 years I lived in the world like an orphan. I am an orphan no longer. How has your life changed as you have been knowing Jesus? And for some of you who haven't known him for that long, how has he made a difference in your life? talking with Aiden, and he knows what it means to get cleaned up. Because we're, we all stand before the living God as miserable sinners. You know, we may not feel miserable, but, you know, nonetheless, if we were to really do a so good self-examination, we would see that we are miserable. And that we're unclean. That we constantly sin against God in thought, word, and deed by the things, remember? Things we've done, left undone. We don't love each other with our whole heart. We don't lo love him. But the one thing that we discover when we come clean before God in Christ, he cleans us up even more for the better. He transfigures us. He changes us. And he says, go and live as you believe. Go tell other people that if they are feeling dirty and hopeless, Full of sin to where, well, it is so different for you, but not for me. I can't get clean. There's no way that God would ever want to clean me up. I'm too awful. Look what I've done. Look at the things I thought of. Look at the stuff I've said. But God isn't interested in our excuses for not getting cleaned up. What God is interested in is hearing that we desire to be cleaned up. That we want 
to confess our sins. And God is right there saying, oh, yeah, I will clean you up. I'll make you new. I will transform you in such a way that life is going to be so different. And you know, I think often we forget to look at our lives as maybe as two-year-olds or three-year-olds. The wonder of a gracious God loving me, loving you in such a way that he would bring us to himself, bring us to faith, either through a parent or a grandparent or maybe a friend or an incident or reading the Bible. <gasps> really? And then what does he do with us after that? When Jesus becomes so real in us, do we want to keep quiet about it? Man, I've seen some folks that when Jesus gets a hold of them, they're wild, I'm telling you. They're, they're really wild for the good. Because they realize what they've been able to leave behind. Because what, what does the law do for us? It accuses us. It keeps telling us how rotten and dirty and filthy we are. But Jesus says, you listen to that, but you also listen to me. And that brings us back to our story when Jesus is there with his disciples, Jesus didn't have to say a single word. He let things fall into place. He let his disciples experience what it meant to be in the presence of an almighty God. And the voice from the cloud says, This is my son, the one that I love. In him I am well pleased. Listen to him. Don't listen to those voices there. Don't listen to what Satan is saying to you here. Don't listen to the, the foolishness of the world. Don't listen to what the newspapers and everything are trying to say to you that is, that is bad and society is trying to say it's good. To ignore that which is good as something that is to be loathed. He says, don't listen to those voices. Listen to him. Listen to my son. Listen to what he's trying to tell you. Listen that you will become transfigured. That you will be changed. Isn't that what the Apostle Paul wrote about? That we, when we experience God's grace, we know that we will be changed. Now, in the way that we, we believe and we serve our risen Lord, but also in that great and glorious day when he puts all things back together to be perfect as they were intended to be, we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. We hear those words almost at every funeral. And you see, there's the point. We were dead, now we're alive. We listen to the voice of Jesus. We don't listen to all the other kinds of things are seen. No, life is, life is horrible. Life is awful. Life has no hope in it. Life is a dreary, drudgery, uh, horrible experience. And then you die. There's no, the best is yet to come. You are being cleaned up. And you are being encouraged to follow this one, this Jesus, who has revealed himself, who has metamorphosed in front of you and says, now I make you metamorphose. You become clean from a dirty person, the sinful nature that you've had. You put me on. You put me on, and I will cover you with my righteousness. You no longer have to stand before me as one who is condemned. You stand before me as one who is redeemed. And it all began on that Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus says, look what's going on around you. You're in the presence of my Father. You're in my presence as the Son of Man, the Savior. Now when we go down off of this mountain, we're going to get to work. I'm going to teach you things that you've never seen before or ever will again. But you're going to do even greater things when I go because I will empower you through the, power, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that marvelous to think this is ours? 
You want to tell? You want to tell somebody how you've been changed? Wouldn't it be grand? It doesn't mean you have to go buttonhole somebody. You just have to live that you are changed for the sake of Jesus. And then, maybe experience your life again for the very first time as a two or three year old with all the wonder and the amazement of God choosing you, saving you, equipping you, and sending you. Amen.